Hey guys, thanks for checking out another episode of Inside the Mind, a podcast for athletes. Today's guest is Chris Collins, a former D1 basketball player with Cal State Fullerton. We talked a bit about his journey so far, as well as uh, what he hopes to accomplish in the future. Before I give away too much, let's roll the intro. And like I say, me getting to college, I understand the mental aspect of it a lot more and then getting through it and seeing how other players went through some things and when stuff got tough it's just like man like some people just don't have the mental to get through it so i I fully understand how important that is yeah yeah is that uh something that you kind of thought that you know you you developed once you got in college or is that something you realized well well before college honestly it was something like I, i knew i had before college but it took me going to college and seeing like just how important it was like i always knew it was important to be like mentally tough and um, always kind of to be like, say, aware of those cognitive things and, and different, you know, um, feelings and emotions and stuff like that. But it kind of, like I say, took me seeing other people to go through and see how they handled adversity and um, different situations not going their way for me to really sit and be like, oh, wow, like this is important. Like the mental aspect mm-hmm. of the game is, is huge. So um, kind of a little bit of both. It's like I say, it's something I was always aware of, but like I said, I, I kind of needed that extra push or like a different example and not be around people that I grew up with, you know, my whole life and, um, or been playing with my whole life. So to finally realize like, Oh wow, like this is really a thing. Like, yeah. 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 Well, we're like, what are some of like the biggest adversities? I would assume mean like losing at a game is one that a lot of athletes kind of struggle with injuries, stuff like that. Yeah, Injuries. Um, my my thing is kind of different like my upbringing and my story is kind of different i was uh i was never really like say a big recruit or nothing i kind of found my way into being a d1 player it was kind of a, a last minute situation for me in high school that summer came and i kind of didn't have the offers i really wanted so um my high school coach kind of came up to me and was like well, what do you want to do and i kind of told him i still didn't know so he said well here's your options you can go d2 or d3 or nai if you want but if you really want to go d1 like you said like it's, it's gonna be tough for you like um you're gonna have to go ahead and like say try out or walk on to the local ones or go juco and go that route i was like okay well i'll try the, the harder try he's like well try the walk on stage so we'll contact the coaches that are been recruiting you a little bit say you're interested you got in the school so he did that for me. A, a few responded back. Fullerton was the one that responded the fastest. They really wanted me to come down there and um, kind of had me on their, like I said, little watch list or radar, whatever it was at the time. Um, and so, like I said, I, I went to the tryout, worked out. They were pretty impressed. They said, yeah, well, we have a spot for you. It's a walk-on spot, but um, we're not going to guarantee you any time or anything like that. And my first coach was really honest with me and said, you know, you're going to have to work and earn your minutes because like say you are the walk-on I said cool I don't I don't really care about that I can I can handle that like I said this is the toughest thing in my life I had to deal with so Mm -hmm. um I kind of just did it that route and and over the couple years my first two years I didn't really play much at all I ended up I said redshirted my freshman year um and then it kind of came full circle for me just staying determined and um kind of like I say just always in the back of my mind knowing that what I wanted was like I say to be at this level and wanted to do more and play more and play at a higher level so that kind of always when it wasn't working out for me and I wasn't getting the time I wanted or I wasn't um, playing the position I wanted to play or should be playing it was kind of just like a a little subtle reminder it's like hey like you've been through tougher times than this and you've done um, a lot more just to get to this level so if you quit right now it's going to look pretty bad on you if you went through all this hard work and then just you know kind of just let it go because it got a little tough or a little too tough for you so um, for sure that's kind of like say my my story has always been that it's always been hey at the end of the day it's yeah this is tough but it could be a lot worse you could be in someone else's situation or you could not have legs there's people that can't even walk and you're over here complaining about not getting playing time like shut up chris yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah you know so that's kind of always been like my thing is like all right chris like yeah it's tough but you know you got to get through it it's just it could be worse so yeah What's the uh, what's the redshirt process like? Did you know kind of going in you're gonna be redshirted, or was it something um, that um, kind of not kind of not really? I didn't really know much about. It. Like I knew there was redshirting and and all that. I kind of wasn't really worried at the time because, like, say I was just trying to make sure that I showed people that I was there for the right reasons. It wasn't just you know someone made a phone call and got me in. It was like no, like I worked my well, my butt off and and 
got to this level and it wasn't like say my travel coach made a call or my high school coach was like no it's like chris got this by like say doing the work and um trying out and, and doing this the hardest way possible so um registering is kind of it's not frowned upon but it's like if, if you're registering then hopefully there's like i say a, a well-developed plan for you and a reason why you're registering uh I think my reason was kind of like, say, my coach looking out for me and understanding like what I wanted to do. And then uh, partially because, like I say, he also wanted to um, make sure that I was mentally tough and, and cut out for going through this process. Because, like I say, a lot of the, um, the other red shirts, I know our friends that redshirted, they ended up redshirting and they weren't really the same after it was kind of like a, Oh, they red shirted. And now it's like mentally, they were just weren't strong enough to keep going. They were like, Oh, why did I get red shirted? Or, um, I was the man on my high school team and I was leading scorer or this and that, or all state or all conference or all league, whatever. And then all of a sudden like, I got a red shirt now. Like why? Like, um, so I never really had that part of it. Like asking why it was more so of a, okay, well, this is his plan for me. Like he's, he's going to have me red shirt this year. And, um, help me figure it out and that was one of the things he told me he was like Chris if it's not here like if you registered this freshman and you want to transfer out I'm gonna promise I'm gonna help you to transfer out it was just more of a respect thing I think yeah um with him so he kind of like say really eased me into it he actually asked me in the middle of a game if I was gonna register we were playing <laughs> um at USC we we're getting blown out so he was kind of just like hey are you sure you want to register like I can get you in and you know you can play this season if you want and I was yeah. just kind of like uh I don't really know if I want to right now because Brady's like, well, I mean, it's up to you, son. He kind of he had like a, a real talk with me like this, like mm -hmm. in the middle of a game, and I'm like, coach, we're on TV, like, should you be? He's like, nah, don't worry about it. Like, do you want to play this season? Like, what do you want to do? I was like, you know what? I think I'm a red shirt and, and just wait. He's like, okay, no problem. And he, yeah. like I say, this is in the middle of a game, and I'm like, dude, you're you're talking to me, like, I'm just trying to get on here and make sure I stay here. Like, I'm I'm not even trying to really worry about playing time and stuff yet. I want to make sure I'm gonna be on this team. Like, I'll work on the playing time later. So um his plan was like i say always to look out for me um uh, and it was kind of a rough year like they 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 we struggled as a team we had a lot of transfers and um some other team issues some guys left right before the season started didn't expect them to leave um so we had a lot of new guys coming in and it kind of was just like a um it was kind of tough at the, at the essence because it was like i say I'm, I'm new to this i'm a freshman i'm coming in i'm playing well in practice i'm starting to score on people and i'm like oh, all these nerves are gone finally and the butterflies are gone like am i i'm supposed to be here i think like i think i'm on the right track and um i, I think i can play with these guys so then mm -hmm. i started playing and get my confidence up and it's like okay wait why did i register like i can perform at if not their level if not maybe even better just because like i say i'm so versatile like maybe I should be playing. So it's, it kind of started creeping in. Like maybe, maybe my confidence is, is kind of withering because it's like, okay, well I am good enough. So what's, what's the reason? Like they like winning their coaches. So coaches should love winning. So why are we not putting me in so I can help my team win? So I think that was kind of like the hardest part of the red shirt aspect for me is just understanding like, Hey, like I red shirted and, and I'm sitting here, but it's like, I could be helping the team and I, I just want to help the team win. Like, I don't want to sit here and see my guys being sad and yeah, stressed yeah. out and, and angry. Like, I, I just want to help them. Like I'm here practicing all the time. Like I have no hidden agenda or secret agenda or looking out just for me only. Like, no, nah, it's, it's never been about just me or, or anything like that. Cause like I said, basketball is a team sport. And I've always known that from a young age. So, mm -hmm. um, that was, I guess the hardest part of it. And like I say, even, after I guess it, it wasn't even really during the redshirt process I think after the redshirt process was harder for me because I understood like hey I'm taking this year to get better I think it was after when I still wasn't playing as much and I was like hey I just sat this whole year and, and did everything and, and played with the guys that are the red shirts that were sitting out last year and you guys love them it's like hey I was a part of that too like can I get some love or can I get at least mm -hmm. like a little bit of playing time so um, I think that was the harder part for me was like say going through the red shirt year and, and dedicating and putting so much time in and then all of a sudden it's still being like hey it's still not enough sorry I think that was harder um, yeah especially on the mental part the mental aspect of it I think that just really took a toll um, as far as like I say just trying to make sure I was um, in the right mental capacity and, and understanding of the business side of it and hey like OK, maybe they didn't want me playing last year because it would have hurt the chances. Maybe this year it's like, hey, we have a better team and 
And then it was, oh, wait, I'm still not getting my time. Like, okay, then what is it now? Like, do I still got to put in more time or, or what? Like, so I think that was, like I said, the, the biggest struggle of the red shirt process. For yeah. Me. Yeah. But looking back at something that, that you feel was helpful still to your college career. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very helpful. Like, not I think even, even my with college, the uh, just life. Oh, life. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think even with a coach like Bob Burton, mm-hmm. who's, you know, who's at Cal State or, yeah, Cal State for what, 10 or 11 years, the, mm-hmm. this whole 10 year. And, mm-hmm. Knowing that, you know, there's a guy that's been around the block and right. uh, led that team right. to the NCAA tournament the one year. Exactly. He kind of gives you more confidence, in, you know, what what he's uh, what he's preaching. And, I, and yep. I think even for college athletes around, it's hard, you know, coming like you said, you come from high school. You're the kind of, you know, the uh, the big fish in the small pond in high school. Mm-hmm. And then you get to, mm-hmm. to college and some of them, you know, they turn into that small fish. But if you're lucky enough to have a coach that, you know, has 10, 15 years of experience, you really have to kind of um listen to what they're saying and just kind of trust their judgment because they've 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 seen kids like like you that that come along every year and they know mm-hmm. what's best for them exactly i think that's that's definitely a fact man like i say people don't always understand like hey this guy's been here this guy's seen a million kids like you that are going to come through these doors and say they want to do one thing but is it really the kid that's going to stay in the gym consistently and 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 work hard and not be a head case and go to class and make sure he's not failing any classes because it's like I say we're taking a chance on this kid so um like I say when I got to my junior senior year I kind of understood that more and I, I took a different approach getting into it um, yeah really how, like how say, did you how did you approach sorry each of your junior and senior year because I know both of those years you had new coaches each year yeah Was it kind of you look at each like as a fresh start or, or what's kind of your perspective um yeah, kind of, sort of. I, I went into it thinking, like, hey, it's going to be a fresh start. And I say when I got there after the – well, basically my first – my second coach was a uh, – he was our interim coach. He was our assistant coach. So he had been there the whole time I was there as well. Um, but, like I say, just thinking I was getting a fresh start and this is a younger coach that's going to give me a chance and um, kind of get into his uh, – tenure and it kind of just turned into the same thing similar so it kind of was just like a hey um okay well this is a business side and yeah coaches are going to tell you one thing but all you can control is how hard you work out so i really ramped it up that summer i really got um to the weight room and and trying to get better and and get stronger because i always knew that was a part of it it's like when you're in college you're basically playing against grown men so it's like hey you got to get your strength up you got to get um uh, your speed up and, and make sure you can guard at this level. That was the one thing I, I always knew was like, okay, well, if I can guard at this level, then I know I'm going to be able to get uh, some playing time because I know I'm I'm one of the more versatile guys. I can guard one through four, one through five, and not everybody can guard all five positions or whatever. So maybe I'll use this as my, my one chance of getting in. So I kind of really dedicated myself to just getting stronger and stronger and, and really building up my muscles. And um, it kind of paid off for me. I would say, like I said, that, that, my red shirt sophomore year, I believe that was. Yeah, my red shirt sophomore year. Um, started getting some playing time. Um, started getting some significant playing time towards like the middle of the year when I was playing in every single game and, and mm-hmm. going on from there. So uh, that definitely, like I say, helped me with my, my confidence and going through that first red shirt year and that second year um, where I wasn't playing as much. And then, like I say, with the first ch- coaching change, that kind of boosted my confidence a little bit a little bit and then it happened again we got another new coach for my senior my well technically my redshirt junior year um same thing happened again I, i'm starting over with a new coaching staff and yeah i would say my i wouldn't say my confidence was so much down it's just so far it's just the um the feeling of okay well now i got another new coaching staff and it's kind of like almost like a travel ball culture where it's like okay every summer i'm going in with a new coach or whatever kind of thing but right um you're kind of thinking, hey, at least in college, you know, I'll kind of have that same stability I have in high school where I, I have the same coach and, and go from there. So it kind of didn't turn out that way that, like I said, that last year. Um, but even that staff was really good. They understood me uh, where I was coming from and how I just wanted to help the team. So um earned my way on to getting my time there as well. Because, like I say, with the new coaching staff comes a new morale and um, – mm-hmm this staff was actually completely different from, like I say, my first two, because like I say, at least my, my second staff was at least one of my assistant coaches was the intern, and he kept most of the staff um, on hand that year. Like I say, this this last coach, or the, the last coaching stand, change was uh, 
like I said, the most drastic and, and really got me thinking like, hey, like you might actually get when you're in the pros, you might get a new coach every year or get a new staff just out of nowhere because um, this is how it works. They don't get rid of players so much. They get rid of staff. So right. Um, I think so that kind of really opened my eyes and got me really ready for that and um, helped me with the, the process of being a pro really tremendously. Because like I say, I, it's, you don't get to really choose your coach or which program you go to. You kind of just have to find a way to um, fit in and, and do what this coach wants you to do and find a way to get on the court or find a way to produce for the team. So um, definitely got that from, like I say, all my coaches at, at Fuits. And I, I definitely learned how to be like that as a, as a pro and as a, a someone in life, even in general, just an adult. It's just uh, things change and sometimes you get a new boss or um, sometimes, like I say, the workplace will, or will change up management on you or whatever the case may be. Kind of like you still have to be yourself and um, still produce and so that you're um, still on board with everything. So I think that kind of really prepared me for that. For sure. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of um, all, all those things that you, you, that you mentioned that you learned with those coaches, did that kind of help you make that decision to go to Dominguez Hill? Um, 2014 was it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that was yeah. Uh, my fifth year. So yeah, kind of sort of, um, I had really, like I say, kind of just wanted to get back to, um, Focusing on basketball, um, yep. not having to worry about, like I say, the ins and outs, getting with somebody I thought uh, that I trusted, um, be close to home. So that's kind of why I picked Dominguez Hills. I had a couple other schools inter- interested in me in the South and a um, couple other smaller schools out there. But I, like I said, I, I had a uh, – my grandpa was pretty old at the time. Um, he was getting up there in age. He uh, – just recent, well, not recently, it's almost been a year now he passed away. He made it to 100 years old, but he was going through uh, dementia at the time. And uh, we were in the process of moving him out of his house and moving him into a, a group home. So it was kind of just a weird transitional phase for my family. I didn't really want to leave, be too far away and let something happen or um, he pass away, unfortunately, like I say, at that time and me be mm-hmm. on the other side of the country. So I, I decided to stay closer to home with Dominguez. Um, that's kind of how that happened. Like I said, I just, uh, I understood where Fullerton wanted to go and the direction they were trying to get into and, um, didn't really want to be on the outside of the business process again. So I kind of took things into my own hands and, um, that's kind of like, say how I ended up at Dominguez uh, Hills is, uh, yeah. that story there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking about, you know, wanting to be close to home, I'm still not really over Kawhi Leonard leaving Toronto, coming to L.A. Man, so. I'm so, I, I understand. I understand in Toronto is kind of, uh, it's probably a little bit of some some bittersweetness uh, feelings yeah. going on over there. Let's like, say yeah. you guys get your first one and, hey, you know, we're we're here for you. We're a perfect place. And he ends up coming back home. And yeah, uh, trust me, I, I understand. I've worked with him for a uh, a summer a couple summers ago and he is a quiet guy so yeah. keeping it all in house and, and not saying anything it doesn't surprise me at all so no oh, yeah uh, i'm only surprised he's a clipper instead of a laker but hey whatever <laughs> <laughs> whatever you wanted to choose it was, he was yeah. a free agent he had the freedom so yeah not only you know is he a top five you know nba player right now but he's got to be like top five athlete just in terms of just approaching the game mentally and yep. kind of you know his his uh his you know determination not only during the game but outside the game he kind of just does you know what's best for him and his family he had um so many people you know telling him stay in toronto just won a championship here whole country behind you you know go to the Mm -hmm. lakers play with with braun and ad but Mm -hmm. he chose to go to the clippers because i'm assuming the clippers are closest to home i don't i don't I guess them and Lakers are pretty close in the LA. They play on mm-hmm. the same arena right now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't know his exact reasons for choosing the Clippers. I don't know if he mm-hmm. grew up a Clippers fan or something, but talk about a guy that like just does everything that he blocks out all the media noise. And he's kind of just like the, the poster boy for athletes of what kids should look up to, yep. um, how to kind of uh, model their mental, their mentality. Exactly. That's the one thing I took away from him, man. Like I say, I, I spent the summer with him and was working out at 5 a.m. up to San Diego State and um, lifting weights with him, too. Like, even the weight room aspect of it, it's like, it's just, it's a different approach. Like, certain players and NBA guys I've been around, it's like, there's the the athletes that are really good, and yeah, they're, they're pretty good at basketball, and, you know, those guys, and then there's the, the superstars that 
get all the commercials and you always see that are all on the all-star ballot and perennial all-stars and stuff like that, like the Chris Pauls and, mm-hmm. um, and the Kawhis. Like I said, I can only attest for them too, because I've been around them the most. It's just like their workouts are insanely intense. It's just the, yeah. the mental aspect uh, with Kawhi is like I said, he, he's 5 a.m. every morning getting his shots up doing his weights and he's done before like 9 30 10 o'clock and he's done for the rest of the day like there's, yeah. there's no more work he has to do the rest is rehab relaxing um but he does it like i say five six days a week and it, it might change the days he might switch up and take an off day because he needs to rest the body or something like that but it's just insane to see how how like i say just methodical they are in their process and not even that i want to say that it's basic but it's just they're so tedious over the fundamentals like the shot he hit over MB driving baseline. I've seen him do that every morning. Like I saw him work out was he'd get up, work on his two dribble pull-ups going right, two dribbles going left, and you do it from every spot over the corner. Then he's going and shooting his two dribble pull-up threes and all other types of stuff and, and just keeping it simple. So it's like his whole game that everyone's all like, oh, my God, he's his offensive game has improved so much and this and that. It's kind of like, well, no, it hasn't really improved. It's just now everybody else gets to see it. And then, like, yeah. you guys are – like, the media will say, oh, wow, he's he's – he's drastically improving. He's, he's put this time in and that time it's like, no, nah, everyone I've known, he's been doing this since he was in Marino Valley and mm-hmm. in middle school, like the hours he would put in, he not even go to parties and stuff like that in high school. Cause he was like, nah, I got to get in the gym or nah, I'd be a San Diego state. Nah, I'm not going to this party. Like, I got to go get some shots up. Like this is how, how dedicated they are to just being good is, is astonishing. But like I say, not everybody can go and, playing a 48 minute game and then all of a sudden after they're done be like hey i got enough energy to go get some more shots up or or yeah. or be like hey i didn't shoot well enough in this game today like we're staying in the arena and we're gonna get shots up once the media goes it's like okay well where, where are those guys at well those are the kobe's those are the james hardens the Kawhis, the chris pauls the guys that that make it look easy on tv and we're sitting here wondering like man how do they do it? it's like well that's how they do it they put in there so. <laughs> every day they're in the gym you don't see exactly. those 23 hours outside the game but exactly they're putting in work 24 7 that part exactly um kind of coming from you know cal, cal state's obviously a, a smaller school in the realm of the ncaa mm-hmm. um how do you you know kind of stay kind of grounded or um how do you not kind of get carried carried away when you're visiting bigger schools or like you said when you're training with nba guys Mm -hmm. you're obviously um just coming from cal state or dominguez hills how do you kind of kind of stay focused in those situations right um one thing my dad taught me at a young age man was basketball is basketball uh when i was younger we were in fourth grade fifth grade sixth grade um so I wouldn't say fourth or fifth. By the time we were in sixth, seventh grade, we were playing in high school tournaments, me and my travel team. So um, we're sitting here expecting to play, you know, other kids that look like us. And we're hopping in high school tournaments in L.A. And like, I mean, the hood, man, like the, the parts where it's like, wait, OK, well, you might not want to put that on a tourist attraction. Like that's where we were going to play. So um, getting to college and seeing older guys, it didn't really bother me. Um, I was never really like, say, worried or like, oh, my God, like these guys are so tall. Like I remember we went to. uh Arizona uh my red shirt freshman year and now I say that back that was my red shirt year um and this is like I say before I decided to to red shirt actually so I'm warming up on the court and I'm like man this is Arizona like this is amazing like wow cool and at the time they were a top I want to say like a top five team or something like that a top 10 team in the yeah country. I even had Derek Williams yeah that day. Derek Williams was that there year, on that yeah. team yeah he was on that team um who I think uh, Momo Jones was on Lamont Jones was on that team at the time. Yes, I think Solomon uh, Hill. Solomon Hill was on that team. Yeah. So like I said, they had a stacked roster, and I'm sitting here, and I know Solomon. Well, I've known of him because I played against him in L.A. So I'm like, okay, the the L.A. guys, I'm I'm not worried about. It. I see Kyle Falk all the time. I see Solomon all the time. Like, cool. I was more worried about when Lou Olson walked in. So I'm like sitting here and like, okay, well we're at Arizona. Like, where's Lou Olson? Where's Lou Olson? And I turned and looked and. He walked by and kind of gave me a head nod, and I was like, "Holy, like, holy hell, it's Lute Olson!" Like, guys, like, yeah, yeah, this is this is like, cause that kind of what got me excited was going to bigger places and not so much of names, but just seeing guys that I had seen on TV. So, like I say, the Lute Olson got me excited, and going to U Dub and playing against like Lorenzo Romar's uh, Huskies before he, like I say, before he left and went to Arizona. I'm I'm sitting there seeing those guys, so I wouldn't say the 
the school per se got me hyped. I was more hyped for like say the the legends I would see when I got there. Like, hey, I'm I'm gonna be excited if we go to UW and I don't know maybe. Uh, Brandon Roy is going to be there one day just because he's there being an alumni. Like that's what's going to get me excited playing in front of them or yeah. um, going to uh, Arizona and maybe, Hey, maybe Jason Terry or Damon Stoudemire is going to pop up one day just randomly just to watch the game. Like that's kind of what got me more nervous than anything uh, playing against the big schools. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of more exciting than I would say than nerve wracking or anything. Cause like I say most of these guys, at least now in, in college basketball, that's one thing I've noticed from talking to a lot of my mentors and older guys, they were like, heck, most of you guys that play D1, you've all played against each other now because travel ball, like I say, the, the circuits and everything going on, it's like you guys have seen each other for years. Um, it's not like back in the day when we were the, the powerhouses or the, the Pac-12 schools and SEC schools and ACCs just beating up on the other little mid-majors. It's kind of pretty evened out with the transfer pool and, and kids mm-hmm. just getting better. It's like, say, there, there's more options for um, kids to play basketball than just going, hey, Power 5 or saying, oh, well, I didn't go Power 5. I got to go D2 or, or NAIA. It's like, heck, even those guys transfer up sometimes. There's Derek Whites out of nowhere that go to D2s for two or three years, and then all of a sudden they spend a year at Colorado, and now, look, he's on the Spurs and Team USA. So I, I would say it was, like I say, not really so much um, – of a nerve wracking process playing those bigger teams. I think it was more of a, um, like I say, just an excitement for me personally. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting that you, you mentioned it kind of seemed more like the, the coaches had more mm-hmm. of uh, it brought up more of that excitement in mm-hmm. you than, than maybe the other players on the team, which mm-hmm. I think kind of, would be something that a lot of athletes could benefit from not kind of mm-hmm. getting caught up in the players, but looking at the mm-hmm. coaches, because the coaches are the ones that shape those players ultimately mm-hmm. throughout their high school and college and even mm-hmm. pro years. And mm-hmm. those are the real mentors that you got to look, look up to and kind of learn from. Exactly. Definitely. Yeah. Like I say, it's, it's not every day when you're, like I say, you're blessed with the presence of Lute Olsen or maybe like somebody like a, uh, a coach K comes in or a Calipari comes in. Like I say, that's, that's the, the vibe now is like okay when those guys walk in it's like oh man i gotta play my best game because they're here so um probably just has kind of transition um just the way basketball is going more with the one and duns and um kind of even how the big schools now the dukes like i said the dukes weren't really into one and duns for a long time and now it's like okay now it's acceptable everywhere so uh whenever you're ready like i said the league is gonna call for you and so like i said when they do your coach kind of has to have that knowing that hey okay well my kids are one and done or my kids should be gone we'll see you later bye I got another yeah, couple yeah. ones coming in. So just the culture and the way it's changing, I think, is the, the biggest reason for that. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's your training schedule looking like now? Are you going five days a week, seven days a week? Uh, right now I'm going either five or four. Uh, just five depends. Four. I like to say I'm, I'm pretty close to like say I'm five or four. I, I hate rest days, and um, I'm kind of trying to implement them more into my schedule now. Like I say, just uh, – listening to my body understanding hey when you're getting older you're not a 19 18 year old kid anymore you just get up and you know run and and go out and windmill all the damn time it's kind of like all right well let me go ahead and i put up 700 shots yesterday did some running got a heavy lift in let me go ahead and just hit the bike or hit the pool today so um really just kind of implementing in different types of workouts nowadays i'm just being smarter with my body and uh finding new ways to like i get the the maximum use out of it without being so strenuous on it um so like I say, I like to see, keep it consistent with the five days a week. Um, weekends, like I say, I'll do a lot of shooting typically on the weekends. So Saturday and Sunday, I don't like to lift or anything. Um, I just get a lot of shots up, keep the repetition up. But like I say, the other five days, Monday through Friday, I'm uh, going pretty hard, man. Like I say, staying in the gym, tons of shots, lots of conditioning, just trying to uh, make sure I'm at my best, man. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I kind of struggle with kind of training myself for, for sport is – you know, I, I try to balance strength and conditioning with mm-hmm. like the actual sport. So mm-hmm. there'll be a day where I'll, you know, I'll be playing my sport and, um, and I'll in the back of my head, I'm like, man, I wish I was at the gym right now. Right. Partly, so that I keep my strength <laughs> and conditioning up and then I go do right. strength and conditioning. And I'm like, oh damn, I should be on the court or something to, exactly. you know, improve my skill or whatever. It's hard. Right. It's hard to kind of balance that. At it least is. for me at the beginning. Yeah. When right. you kind of get out of a, a more structured environment and you're kind of mm-hmm. on your own. Mm hmm. Definitely, definitely, man. And I, uh, I even did the same thing. Like I say, when I'm getting out of college, I, or not even, I wouldn't say getting out. I would say during college, I started it a little more. 
um, lifting and then shooting just to simulate, like, say, me being a little more tired. And I had some teammates that were just, like, super against it. Like, oh, my gosh, like, you just lifted. What do you mean you're going to go shoot right now? Like, your arms are going to be dead. I'm like, yeah, no, but I can still shoot. Like, so what if yeah. I'm a little tired? I mean, that's okay. But um, Chris Paul used to do that all the time. He was the one that kind of taught me. He was like, no, like, lift first, then shoot. It's the best thing you could do because then you're going to be tired and be able to gauge and, understand hey when i'm fatigued okay i need to put this into my shot or that into my shot and, and seeing yeah. how he lifted so heavy and then would go and shoot right after and i mean like strenuous shooting like if i miss one in a row that i'm starting all over type of shooting i'm like jesus chris like this is this is pretty tough man this is almost damn near insane and he's like no this is this is what it takes like yeah it is insane yes but you got to be a little insane like, wow, it's okay. almost <laughs> like when you when you like run with like a, a weighted vest or something mm -hmm. and then when you take mm -hmm. the vest off um you you know it makes running that much easier so if you're exactly. taking shots you know trying to simulate a third or fourth quarter and then you get mm -hmm. out there it's the first quarter and that you know they just start flying out exactly um, exactly are you still are you still involved in the i know you're doing a bit of coaching on the side as well yes uh, I am. are you still yes, involved in that as well yeah i am i'm actually kind of in the process right now i'm in a transitional phase with that uh the team i was previously with they ended up merging with another program so i saw it as a perfect time for me to kind of uh, jump in and get my feet wet. I always wanted to start my own program um, myself. And like I said, I, I knew I wanted to work with kids from a younger age and always knew that, like I say, basketball was something that helped me get to being the man I am today. So I, I kind of wanted to, like I say, take things into my own hands and um, start up my own little program. So I, I started Collins Basketball Club uh, this month, actually. Like I say, we're going to be finalizing all our uh, tryouts and everything soon. Um, Really just like I say, get the youth started. I'm not really interested in, in high school per se right now. Um, I'm really, like I say, connected to the youth. I have a little cousin that's 10 right now, and he's uh, really into basketball. Um, his dad was a, a very prominent high school coach out here, passed away, unfortunately, a couple years ago. Um, so like I say, me being the only other real basketball player in the family, um, really felt inclined to sit here and make sure that he was taught the right way and the fundamental way. So um, really doing it, not for him all per se, but he's a huge reason why I do it. Cause I know he loves basketball and loves seeing how his face lights up when he gets to play. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at now. Like I say, just in the opening stages of that and getting things started. So uh, definitely, definitely uh, excited about that. How much, how much of a focus do you have kind of on the mental side of the game versus, you know, the physical or, you know, strategic side of basketball? Personally, I'm more about the mental side right now. Um, to be honest with you, it's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, let's say I work majority with really young ones. I had a couple nine and under teams, a couple 10 and under teams. So I'm, I'm working with the babies right now. Um, and I, I really don't want to kill the game for them or anything. So, um, mentally, I, I love stressing of, of just simply remembering what play we're running. Remember who you're guarding on defense. Remember um, time and, and score. So real um, mental parts of the game. I'm not really worried about if they can do dribble step backs or how many threes they can make or how many half court shots they can make. I'm like, yeah, that's great and all, guys, but you can't even make these shots two in a row right now. So that's yeah. fine. But I'm more impressed with you guys using your backboard on all your layups and not airballing those. So when you guys do that in, in two or three times in a row, then coach Chris will be excited. But um, that's kind of like say where I'm at. I, and I understand, like say the, the league is going into a, a more offensive league and, and, and scoring is selling tickets and, and there's talking about expanding the three point line and all that stuff. But it's something about the, the simplicity and the, the mental aspect of a game of understanding, like say the, the, the key concepts that really, really takes you farther in life than understanding. Okay. Well, I hit a step back three and it got on YouTube and I got a, so many views like, yay, but like I say, if, if you mentally can't be tough enough to go guard the best player or make sure your man doesn't score, remember to box out all the time or at least half the time, like, then it's okay. Well, to me personally, it's like, okay, you're not really working as hard as you should be, buddy. Cause like say you're hurting the team by not boxing out this one time or boxing out in a, a key crucial point of the game where it's only 30 seconds left and we need a rebound. So, um, so that part of the game is huge for me. That's, that's what I love teaching. Um, yeah. 
And that's almost the perfect time to do it too. Um, yep. You know, before, you know, they start to develop more, I guess, of an ego and, and mm-hmm. you know, they get older and they're, mm-hmm. you know, less likely to, to listen to their coaches, I guess, in that mm-hmm. regard, or it would be harder mm-hmm. for the coaches to break through. Right. And you think exactly. about, you know, long-term goals for players, um, you know, they're only in the prime of their career for so long. And after mm-hmm. that, it really is, you know, the mental side of the game that carries them through, you know, somebody mm-hmm. like, like Vince Carter or or mm-hmm. uh, or Jamal Crawford, they're still mm-hmm. balling out there. Exactly. You know, they would they wouldn't be out there right now if they didn't have that mental part of their game, like almost 100% perfect every game. Exactly. If they yeah. didn't come and do the same warm up every game or uh, do the same typical workouts. I remember I was working with the Clippers for a little bit and uh, the uh, I was doing kind of like game night staff. One of the many things I've done for them over the last couple of years. But I was working the event staff and game staff for them one night. And I remember when they played the Hawks, I wanted to get here. Actually, no, this is when he was with the King. I'm sorry. This is when Vince was with the King still. I remember I wanted to get there super quick just so I could see Vince Carter's warm up. And I'm just like watching it in awe because he's literally warming up like he's only in year like five, six or, or five or six or something like that. And he's doing all his shots and he's doing them at a high speed and um, really under control. And he's even dunking like I'm like, oh, this is Vince Carter actually dunking, dunking. Like, I'm sitting here <laughs> thinking he's going to you know, barely rev it up. Like, no, Vince is doing windmills and 360s and cockbacks. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. So it's it shows that when you put in that time every day to your craft and, and want to get better, like, the, the benefits of it will come. Um, but like I say, I, I've, I've seen even Jamal's workouts. Jamal works out the same way. It's not like he has a strenuous workout. Jamal basically just goes around and messes around for 45 minutes to an hour just shooting, not trick shots, but just – one-on-ones pretending like someone's in front of him and i'm like this is what works for you and and i had a person pull me aside and be like yeah this is all he does for workouts like he plays all summer in his pro-am and then he'll go out occasionally and do his little dribble warm-ups and and get up a couple shots and that's it i'm like this is how he's made his whole career like yep this is all he's done and i was just like wow like that's astonishing how how god-given basketball can be a, a talent or um how if you put your work in for so many years, how you can still be in there for this long, like events, or it can just be natural. You could be a, a Jamal Crawford and just love the game and come in and just work on, you know, simple things and, and not really put all this strenuous, oh, I need to lift, 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 and do this and do that. And it's like, no, that didn't, that's not what he needed. He just needed to be consistent with the sport. So yeah. I think that's just the, the main thing is just being consistent is uh, what leads to that success. Yeah. Being consistent and, and, and knowing what works for you too. It's, yep. it's, you know, every everybody, every athlete is unique, and it, it, something different will work for everybody. And I think it's good for athletes to to still look up to a, the other athletes, obviously, and kind of model what they're doing and stuff. But mm-hmm. if it's not working for you, then don't keep doing it just because it worked for somebody else. Exactly. Um, you you got to always be reevaluating what you're doing, your training, mm-hmm. um, always always kind of making sure that you're progressing in the right direction and if you're right. not you you got to kind of have that ego check and saying you know maybe i don't know everything maybe somebody else can help me or maybe i gotta do some more research in some way and, and try to improve here exactly definitely like i said that's the the hardest thing for some people to look is look inward and be like okay what can i do differently <laughs> yeah yeah. Um, so what's your plan now with basketball? Do you have kind of a, uh, a time when you think that you'll kind of step away and focus more on the coaching or maybe, um, you know, is there, would it be like certain thoughts that get in your head that you're like, okay, I'm kind of, you know, I'm ready to go to coaching full time. Um, yeah, kind of sort of, like I said, I told myself by the time I'm 30 plus, like I should be solidified and like, hey, like I said, I tried and gave my effort and did this and that. So like I said, I got a, a few years before that. I'm only 27 right now. So um, definitely, I say by the time I'm 30, focusing more on, like I said, the, the family aspect and um, getting that right. But like I say, while I'm in this this uh, age right now, I'm, I'm pretty sure, like I say, anything can happen. I, the last couple of years, I saw Pablo Prigioni and Marcellus Huertas and Andre Ingram, and they were all 30 plus and gray hairs and just getting their first chances so um for me personally it's just a a stay consistent uh mentality it's like hey i I know i've been through some 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 horrible situations i've been through some short end of the stick situations where i thought personally i should have got more out of it and it didn't happen that way and sometimes that's just how it rolls there um ends out that way sometimes for some people but um and say my thing is just having confidence and knowing that I can play at a certain level and knowing that, hey, in the, in the day I can 
change and forget about everything else that, that's happened to me coming up to this point. Cause like I say, from now on, I've gotten this contract. Or I'm going to this country to play or whatever. It's like, okay, well it was worth it. I went through all this nonsense and all these hardships and now look where I'm at. So, um, I would say, like I say, it's kind of more of a I'm always ready type of thing. I just signed with a new agent. I just actually signed with a Metal World Pieces agency. Um, he kicked up just now, not too long ago, last month. Um, really kind of say just got me a little more confidence because, like I said, the last couple agencies I was with, um, they just weren't, like I say, the all together. Like I say, I wouldn't say not that they weren't ran too well. It was just they had other focuses at the time. The first agency I was with, they were most focused on baseball and football. Um, the agency I was with uh, just previous to signing with uh, Meta's agency, they were um, pretty solid. But like I said, they had a, a really big clientele base. They were switching out agents at the time. They were trying to get some new, um, new faces in there. So I kind of... Uh, I don't want to say for lack of a better term, but got lost in the scuffle of, like I say, them getting new agents and clients and everything. So I didn't really feel like I was a priority with them. So um, now that I'm with Meta's agency, I got a nice little agent I'm working with under their umbrella. So um seems like she's actually, like I say, giving me a chance and, and putting in the work and um, trying to shop me around for the best deal possible. So I, I really feel like, say, the love and uh, the respect that uh, I've been searching for basically with the agency from them. So um I so said, hopefully I'm on the right track now and the right path. Like I said, this has been a whirlwind and um, it's been a long journey. So like I said, hopefully, like I said, before I uh, uh, get put under this ground and, and go on to wherever my next journey is in life, then I, I can say I can be, a, I've been a pro athlete uh, for a few years of my life. That's always been the goal. So um, you can say until I reach that 30 mark, then I'm like, okay, well maybe I'll go ahead and just focus full on, on, uh, coaching or, or whatever else is uh put on the table for me yeah and you know if, if you had to pick you know a, a guy to run your agency i don't think there's anyone that's been through more than than meta world peace you exactly know? And, and right. what what a kind of a turn like he had such a turnaround from you know mm-hmm. the brawling days um mm-hmm. and now kind of looking at him now he's like almost a completely different person and i yeah. think like you know he's got to be one of the best role models out there for 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 guys to oh definitely to you know make it through the league or, or make it through whatever they got to go through in life not just basketball but life in general definitely man like i said he's he's challenged me on numerous occasions and i don't even think he realizes like how much of an influence he's been i remember i, I first met him when i was doing my internship with the clippers a couple years ago and uh they like I say my my guys at the Clippers, they were amazing guys. They let me get on the court with them a couple times and got me through a pre-draft workout and um, let me participate in one. So like I said, I'm forever thankful for that. They uh, they ended up, Meta used to come up to the open gym that they used to run out of the facility. And uh, the first couple of days, like I say, I was playing and everything. And then I, I at the bad time, had a bad heel. Um, had some stress, stress from my, not a stress, was it a stress? I think it was a stress fracture, maybe plantar fasciitis, one of the two on my foot. And so I told myself I wasn't going to play that day. Meta came in and was like, oh, what, you don't want to compete today? I was like, nope, let me go get my shoes. I'll be damned if Meta's going to call me out. <laughs> so, um, he did that, but he's a, a great basketball mind, man. Like I say, he's, he's uh, one of the, the best defenders I think I've ever seen in my life. Like I say, that can guard one through five and, and, can sit here and methodically just get you out of your game and, and doesn't matter if it's in, a, in the same game. I saw him go from muscling Julius Randle and them sounding like Rams hitting each other's heads and skulls in a fight. And then the next play, he's over here ripping point guards and, and stuff like that. I'm like, dude, how are you just this good to be in a mental space where you can go and, and bang big bodies with one of the strongest power fours in the league and then go rip one of the smallest guards with the quickest hands? Like, Man, how good are you, Meta? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things that was really astonishing to me, man. So, like I say, I'm, I'm glad that I'm with such a good basketball mind and um, really thankful for that, man. Like I say, a lot of people don't get this opportunity to be even considered or represented by, by like, say, people in higher places and with a little bit of power. So, I'm glad that he took a chance on me and the agency took a chance on me, man. So, hopefully, like I, say, I can have a big payoff and, and, and pay them back for believing in me and, uh, I said, really get this thing going. For sure, for sure. Mm-hmm. Listen, man, thanks for doing this with me tonight. Um, no problem, man. If people wanted to catch you on social media, what's what are your social media handles? Basically, everything is Chris Trace Dose. So it's Chris, C-H-R-I-S, 
Tres, T-R-E-S, Dos, D-O-S. Uh, shout out to Chad Johnson, Chad Ochocinco. He gave me the inspiration for that one a long time ago in high school. So uh, kind of just stuck with me. And like I said, 32 is my favorite number. So <laughs> you can there find you me on anything on that, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, like I said, follow me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyways, Chris. Yeah, again, thanks for doing this, man. And uh, we'll keep in touch. And maybe we'll do this again sometime. Appreciate it, Adam. I'd love to be yeah. back on anytime, man. Thank you. Once again, guys, thanks for listening to this episode of Inside the Mind and Podcast for Athletes. If you liked any part of this episode, please share it with your friends and family, and I'll see you next time.